So John, thanks for the opportunity today uh, to, for the interview and obviously thanks uh, as well Malcolm for you know, helping us set it up. Um, I'm, I'm going to take you back obviously to the, the, the heady days of you know, the Magpie Group and, and, and where it all began I suppose. Yeah. Uh, you know, first of all, so John, I mean, you know, what was the idea behind it? Why did you, why did you suddenly have this need for involving <coughs> football? It wasn't my idea, no, no, this, this fella. Um, if I recall basically, Markham and the lads with him, Alan Rooney and others. John Wolfe, yeah. John Wolfe, that's right, and uh, Pierre Ratcliffe. That's right, Pierre Ratcliffe and them had been fighting the club for some time before I got involved. And they made so much project progress, but for the stumbling block. Because it was going to take a lot of cash to really, if you're going to take them on. And um, they were looking for someone to help them. And at the time, I've always been a Newcastle fan. I'm an Ashington lad, so um, I came when I was eight years of age. 1941 was the first match with my dad. And uh, just stand on the popular side. And not many people remember, there was a plank of wood around the length of the popular side. It was just earth steps. And there was a pie shop on the corner. And if you got in early, you stood on the plank of wood to see the game. If you were late getting in, they rolled you over the head to the front. <laughs> so that's my early start with Newcastle. So I'm, I'm you know, from Ashton, I was fanatic. Um, the love for the club's always been there. And I used to stand and look across at that old wooden director's box, looking up there you know, to God's castle, never think that one day I'll be there. And uh, he came to see me, and I was building the Metro Centre, and um, I made a bit of money from that, and from the business dealings that done, as I became a property surveyor. Started in the pit as a, a mining surveyor, mining engineer. Became a charter surveyor and went into property development and built up my own company, which was hard. And I started the Metro Centre, and uh, we were in these second hand porter cabins. I saw we were going to on site. And then walks this fellow with his own tool rod. <laughs> what do you want? Come and sit down. And the next place is, I've got too much to do. I said, I kind of get involved on. I've got this to do at the Metro Centre, you know. I don't want to take on the old board, the old families, you know. And they left, and they kept coming back. And they did a dirty trick on me. They went and basically saw Bob Cass, the mail on Sunday. Yeah, yeah Bob. From Durham. He said, a closet that's, uh, I'm surprised, it's a closet that's someone's support. I'm not gonna. Most of them are up here, it's surprising. <laughs> Darlington's support, he came. And he <laughs> came in and it was, a, always remember it. You have these images you have. And remember, it was a Friday afternoon at the end of a difficult week. And it was raining, bad weather. And um, we came in to the port of cabin. What do you want, Bob? I need to talk to you. Now, I'm not a whiskey drinker, but I used to keep a bottle of whiskey in the cupboard in case anybody. Now, Bob loves a drink. And I said, no, 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 Bob. And he goes, I'm, I'm not interested. I've got too much to do. But by the time we've finished that bottle of whiskey, this actually happened. I must have been maudling a bit, you know, eyes rolling. And I said, I'll tell you what I'll do, Bob. I said, I'll put half a million pounds on the table as part of a consortium, because I never want to own a football club. You know, you've got to understand that it was not, I was a businessman. I was building things. Football wasn't part of my scene. As a supporter, yes, standing on the terraces and shouting, sack the bomb with everybody else. Mm -hmm. um, always wanted that privilege. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so, I said, I put half a million pounds on the table, but you've got to go and find want two million pounds to force the board to buy some shares and to force the club, the directors, to put shares on the market. I always felt it was a people's club and I wanted to democratise it. I wanted the people to own it. Not me, but the fans to own it. And, um, okay, so he carried the story the following Sunday. So John promises this, looking for other saviours, whatever. But the thing was that you cannot carry a story from Sunday to Sunday. You've got to have somebody who carries the story through the week. So I approached Skipper, he did, mm -hmm. Markham did, and Gibbs, John Gibson, a very, very good ally at the beginning, went to see Grim Stanton, who was editor of the Chronicle at the time, yeah. and they threw that weight behind us, which was tremendous. 
And um, that's when it took off, when that my group took off, and that, that's how it all happened. Mm. You, you obviously made that that decision, Malcolm. You knocked on the door. Uh, you know what? What was your you know what was your method? You know you were you were obviously a big Newcastle fan still on this day. But what was your you know what what pushed you forward to make a stand? What made you do that? Well, I, I couldn't get any further forward. I mean, I sort of had various battles with the, you know, a lot with Westwood and Rutherford and McKee. And I mean, I had extraordinary general meetings. We had high court actions. I mean, it was it was becoming silly, really. It was costing me money. I mean, they they, they put the bailiffs into my house at one stage, uh, Newcastle United. So I mean, you know, they, they weren't very nice people, some mm -hmm. of them. Um, but I realised that we needed somebody with financial clout, and John was the man of the moment. And you know, he 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 came across as a genuine person who had Newcastle and the area very much in mind. And I didn't think there was any doubt at all that he was the, the person. I mean, you know, it, in fairness to John, it didn't take a lot of persuasion because I think John, in his own way, liked um, a bit of publicity. And of course, publicity doesn't do anybody any harm when you're building a, a huge uh, shopping complex in the middle of Gateshead. So, you know, the, the two gloved in quite well together. And uh, I mean, we, it was a, it was a marriage. I mean, we, we used to have some real old battles <laughs> down here and in other places because, you know, the people don't always agree in the way you go forward. But, you know, in, in, the, in the very end, we, we went forward very, very positively when we decided to go and get chairs. And that was the book. Yeah, we had to get a we had to get a policy. It all happened in the dining room through there when we had the big table, in. and um, we brought on board what was the name of the lawyers and accountants? Uh, oh God, it was uh, well Minkoffs. Was it Minkoffs, Minkoffs, Minkoffs and Gold, Gold. And, <coughs> as advisors because they had been involved with marketing right. himself. Yeah. <coughs> we brought them on and knew all about it, what to do, etc. And I said, Martin had fought the battle, he never had really got the credit for what he'd done because he sort of opened the wedge, opened yeah. the dam. The breach was done by Malcolm. He just someone else have to step in. And I called a meeting down here, Douglas, and um, we decided we, we, we wanted the club to democratise. We wanted the board to put shares on the market. And I think we wrote to the to the club, but they weren't interested. There was, you know, in many many ways, Newcastle United Football Club epitomised English business. What had happened was. Would build up the businesses in the old Victorian times. Yeah. Strong entrepreneurs like myself, the first one that started the business, made the money. Mm. And after that, the money was spent. It was never made, you know. And, and Newcastle, the board was like that. They'd been built up by the old um, entrepreneurs, bring together Newcastle East End and West End, getting a great team and getting success. But after that, the families were the shareholders. But they didn't have, to be fair, the wealth. To take it forward to where it needed to go, yeah. and they were sort of in this doldrum, um, and without any means of fighting really. So they wouldn't do anything, and so we decided down here that we really had to buy some shares to get a foot in the door. Mm. Um, and this is where the team was great because they knew everybody that had the shares, they knew who'd sell. And it was interesting that Douglas at the time said to me, "Dad, give me a million pounds, and I'll go and get control." And I said, no, we're not doing it that way. We're going to be do properly buy the book and talk to people. It cost me a lot of money that decision <laughs> because the 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 old families wouldn't sell, and we had to put money on the table, had to find one or two who'd sell, and um, we eventually got up to forty percent, and that meant that we were the biggest shareholder in the club, Cameron Hall, and and the lads were coming in. Remember, sitting through that. How have you got? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's actually all on television now, isn't it? The tears, yes, yeah. Time yeah. 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 And the countless of shares were had, etc, etc. And eventually got the 40%. Um, and um, I had to put a bit of a manifesto on it, didn't we? But you did, I mean... I've got it through this somewhere. I'll get it for you. Manifesto, which basically saying what we're going to do. Right. By group. Yeah. And um, we, we then had to put us on the board. And I remember when they invited Douglas and I, I remember this vividly, going in the old boardroom, and Jim Smith was the manager. I am a Jim, yeah. And he walked out. When Douglas and I went, he said, I am not sitting here with these people, because I challenged them. 
Remember what about it? We were going down. Yeah. Remember? And he wanted to buy an old old set of half place somebody. Was it was it Aitken? Yes, right. Yeah, Aitken, Aitken, Aitken. Aitken. That's right. Yes. And and it was past his best. And <laughs> I said, No, you can't do that. I said, I'm not agreeing to it. And never forgive me for challenging himself. Who's friends now? But he walked out and I was left there. And so I was on the board and, and Douglas and I and we said, Look, we must give the fans a chance to buy the shares in this club. I remember that yeah, yeah, launched me. And 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 the no, I said you're going to, and so put a million pounds of shares out, mm. and that was one of the biggest disappointments in my life. The fans <clears> didn't take them up. We sold about a hundred thousand, I think. I and think it was because at, the, at that time, unfortunately, we were down at the very bottom. Of there was the no division. It's pretty, yeah. There but, you know, no unfortunately, with football, it's one of these things. It's an emotive thing. Yeah, but if you're a true fan <clears> and you, you love should. your club, mm -hmm. you're going to buy. Come hell or high water, you, you know, that, that, that's, that's the test of a true fan. And I was a fool, and I remember going out the boardroom afterwards, and the whole lot of them, I think, laughed at me behind the back and said, basically, oh. Yeah, but they were doing that, John, to you, because, I mean, McKeague and the rest of them, even that company that they had doing the share issue, uh, I forget the name now, they were a firm of um, brokers. They, they didn't seem to be terribly interested. I, I always felt that we were... A, they were still in opposition to us, the existing Oh, they were. People. I know that. Because, but, you know, but, but we've got what we wanted. We've got basically the opportunity for the fans. Mm. That club could have been democratised. Have we got the million back? Yeah. We're wedging. Yeah. Then they'd been on the board. Mm. The fans would have been on the board. The fans would have had a say. Mm -hmm. And I wouldn't have had to take it over. Right, <laughs> yeah. exactly. And this is what I was hoping for. <laughs> and, and so when they didn't take it up, I remember I went, I said, right, I'm going on holiday. That's right, you were. And Thomas Cook. Basically, we never had much of a holiday life now, just people worked and travelled out, etc. And Thomas Cook, it was his 150th anniversary of his death. Right. Or his, or whatever, and the thing. And the, 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 what they did was, I saw this advert for a round the world trip. Mm -hmm. 21 and a half thousand pounds each, remember now. <laughs> and I said, we'll go, I'll take you there. Oh, come on, it was a month away. On a plane, flying around the world, and. Uh, so, so we'll go. So we went and we went down to London to sign up, etc., and meet everybody, etc. And then the wheeled Alan Wicker in. Mm -hmm. I remember the wheeled Alan Wicker in to do a program. Right. And that program has been on television a thousand times, <laughs> and uh, we never got paid. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it was, it was, it's oh, it's, it's there on, on, on whatever it's geographic, whatever. But anyway, had a great time. And this is absolutely true that I vividly remember it. And, I was in Repulse Bay at night time staying in this hotel in Hong Kong and we're having a meal, all of us together. Mr. Hall here, I said yes, there's a telephone call, I said, who the hell knows I'm here? <laughs> well, I mean, <laughs> this is Hong Kong. <clears throat> Douglas and Freddie on the coast, it was eight, ten hours difference. Mm -hmm. The afternoon was here, here in, in England and midnight across there. Douglas and Freddie in the boardroom, and I said, "What do you want?" I went. And I said, "Dad, Dad, uh, what do you want?" I said, um, "The club's going bust." I said, "Don't be so daft, I said, "I've just left you. I've just been halfway through the thing." And he says, "No," he says, "The Barclays Bank are pulling the club, uh, pulling the plug on the club." I said, "Why?" He said, "That's a long story, Dad." He said, "But it was on forty minutes," and I said, well, "I'm back in a week's time. Ten days. Ten says, It's too late. It's today." We'll have to make the decision. We'll have to put um, £845,000 in the club. They're not going to put their money in unless we put our money in because we were the biggest shareholder. And they're all sitting there waiting for our decision. And so I was right. I still got not put it in. So I said, oh, angry by then. Of course, they sort of spoiled the holiday, but you know, I would spend another £845,000 because it's, I'd spent quite a lot getting 40% of the club. You haven't been paid for that TV program, I guess. <laughs> And, and so when I came back and I found out what had happened was that the club had an overdraft of £1 million pounds to Barclays Bank and they, on the condition that they didn't buy any footballers. Well, the board went and bought a player. We came out who it was and for about two or 300000 and Barclays Bank said, right, we're pulling the plug. So the only alternative then was for the shareholders to put the money in. So, of course... Well, and hadn't told me this when I'd been on the board. Mm -hmm. 
They kept themselves. I said, you can't run a business. And when I came back, I was so mad at the stupidity what they'd done. We all sat again and said, we've got to launch a takeover now. And that's when the lads came in again. Mm -hmm. And we went out and then the price went up and um, we had to buy them all in. And eventually we bought 90% in and we had control of the club. And that's basically how it happened. Um, and I said, genuinely, you got to get so I never, never wanted to own a football club. Mm -hmm. But as a businessman, when I was in this position, you either back it or you lose your money. Yeah. Well, not having losing money. So I just said, right. And I'm the kind of individual that goes for the jugular. Mm -hmm. And I've just learned this in the sense if you're going to do something, somebody has to be a bit of a dictator. Mm -hmm. You don't, when your companies get huge, you need boards. Yeah. to basically to, to, to manage the divisions. But when you're a small family business, like the old entrepreneurs of Newcastle and Island years ago, yeah. you've got to be single-minded to drive it through. And I was that person that gave it the direction. I was that person that really decided how we're going to take it forward. And the Backpower Group was a tremendous help. I wouldn't have never done it without their help. They just threw themselves into it. I mean threw themselves in. Zoom, 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 traveling everywhere. I've got the share, I've got that share. And we sat through in the dining room again, mm -hmm. and eventually we, got, we had 90 odd percent, 96 percent or something. Mm -hmm. We said, just leave the other four percent alone, we'll mop them later on. Mm -hmm. And I just said, right, you're out. And I came and cleared the old board out, and then we had to make it work. Mm -hmm. And yeah. none of us knew anything about, I'm a businessman, I knew how to run businesses, but football is a business and a sport. Mm -hmm. I'd watched the sport as a young man, mm -hmm. loved the sport, but I'm now a businessman. Mm -hmm. And I've always held that view that soccer is a business and a sport. You need somebody to direct the soccer on the pitch. I cannot tell you, I cannot assess a game and basically I'm not sure, but I cannot plan the game. That's mm -hmm. especially in his own business. That was key in there. And I'm the businessman driving it forward, where do we get the cash from, how much do we need, keeping a tight rein on the money. And I came in and we just started down here at Winyard, Winyard Hall, and I got the local authority to give me planning permission down here to develop. 900 houses, business, huge business park. And um, when I'd be in the States, and this is another, it's a multi million pound development. Um, but I couldn't do the two. I didn't have the cash to do the two multi million pound businesses, which just growing the business. So I had to stop everything here. And I had, it took 10 years to come back and do it again. And I, I fell out with it, the council fell out on me because I didn't build it fast enough here. And we, of course, there were all middle supporters down here. And of course, and when I took Newcastle forward, there was a lot of ill feeling down here. But this became the bank. So every time I had to borrow money, we put put in your hole as guarantor. Because we paid cash for this. But we had to put a lot of money at Newcastle. It was, I don't know, about 10 million or something at the time. Mm. Then eventually became cash in and loans in, you could get repaid. And basically we took it forward. And I just, and then. You got Freddie, of course. I'm, I'm, I'm coming that now. Yeah. I knew nothing about <clears throat> the, the business right. side, the, the soccer side. But I was well, very, very friendly with, um, and you've got to take your hat off to him. The fans should lift their glasses of brown ale and drink a drink to um, Scottish Newcastle. Yeah, yeah, I mean, Alistair. Alistair no, no, it's David Stevens. David Stevens. Oh, yeah. uh, yes, yeah. <coughs> David Stevens. David Stevens. The two of them basically yeah. were on board, so we'll help you, and they did help us. Mm -hmm. And I knew nothing. And, and Alistair Wilson, That's God bless him, he's died now. Alistair said, to us, I know a fella, I know a fella. He's in, Green, he's in Rangers. I said, oh, hi. He said, he's just left them. So he brought this fellow called Fletcher down. And we're going on well. And I said, oh, you want to have, hey, I'll come in with you. And he put himself a thousand percent into it. And believe you me, basically, had it not been for him on the football side, we would never go through. So I managed to pull a big a team together mm -hmm. uh, on the football side, and we were the financial side. And Freddie. We needed a, oh, I'm here that time now. Ozzy is manager. Ozzy, that's right. right. Yeah. And we were going down with Ozzy, you know. Yeah. And and I said, <coughs> we'll have to get rid of him, Freddie says. Said, How do you do that? Leave it to me. So I think it was about 7.30 in the morning. <laughs> Freddie went around. <laughs> oh, you know, I said, hello, 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 Freddie. Hello, Freddie, how are you? Come in, come in, come in. He said, you're sacked. <laughs> 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 it was like that. You know, <laughs> Ozzy shook his hand, yeah. And what was he being friends with? He knew it was coming. Yeah. And, and Ozzy went. Who do we bring in? He says, Keegan. I said, Keegan, but he's been out the game for years. He says, ah, he says, and he'd found out, that, 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 probably to the brewery again, yeah, mm -hmm. said, yeah. that he'd been out of the game for eight, ten years, and he was bored over then, he wanted to come back. Mm -hmm. Now, the one thing about him was, you know, 
he had been out of the game, but he hadn't lost his touch for the game. He must have read all the papers and kept in contact yeah. and knew how all the players were. And he kept he kept the knowledge of the game. So Freddie Douglas and Freddie went out and saw him in Marbella, and he agreed to come back. And they brought him back, and um, it was a moment in time mm. when things happened. When we were looking to find him, and he was looking to find us. Because we found somebody who had nothing to lose. Yeah. When there are no situations, you go for broke. Mm -hmm. Just drive it through. I was the motivator. I went out and we went around, remember? Talked to all the fans. Mm -hmm. Around all the clubs yeah. in the area. This is, what, this is what they don't do today. Mm -hmm. We went out to Bedlington, Ashington, South Shields, North Shields. Whatever those are working men's clubs. You had May on the... And May, was, ah, May, was, May was talking to the fans as well. Yeah. And he said, this is what we're trying to do. Yeah. And we've got them on our side. Said, it's going to take time. We can't do it overnight. So they understood that we needed time. And we had tremendous reception everywhere. And we bonded together. We used to go into the strawberry, you know, and have the drinks. And say, this is what you go. Because as I say, I was just one of them. I was a fan of being in it and I was a chairman. And um, Fletcher brought Keegan in and we backed Keegan. We backed Keegan to the hilt, basically. And, and I think at the end of the day, we got 60 million. We gave them for players, but he knew what to buy them. And it was just, it just took off. And it was one of the most exciting time in my life, basically, mm -hmm. when, when the Keegan years, the wonderful football he played, mm -hmm. and the rapport he had. And uh, we gave him land over here to build a house. Mm -hmm. And he had about 100 acres, 80 acres, and he built a house and had paddocks for his horses and that. And um, we got on well with him at the time. And it just, and slowly things differed. I don't want this on tape. I don't, this, this is not to be put into the thing. But, right, okay, sorry. Well, it's in this part I want to put in. But we, um, when I'm dead, you might put it on, but not before. <laughs> well, you've said that. That's good. <laughs> this, this, is, this is not for publication. We started going around with Keegan, basically. When the pressure came, he couldn't take the pressure at times. Mm -hmm. It was difficult for him. That was the one. He used to sit in his car at night. His mother would ring my wife for PMA. I said, I'm worried about Kevin. He's sitting in the car. In the dark, in the garage. Just sitting. Pressure. Used to go over and see him, etc. And then he started to walk out. The first time he did, I was living here, mm -hmm. and he went back to Southampton. Shortly after I came in, I said, I mean, I came back from the I got back from the match. I was coming down, he flown from down to Southampton. And May says, The presser, what do you want? He says, I'm pressing him. What do you got? What do you mean, Keith? He's gone, so he left. And I said, oh, what the hell's going wrong now? And my wife said to me, so to you two stupid buggers with the ones that have got to get together and he's waiting for you to pick up the phone. I'm not picking up the phone. No. I remember you rang me as well and I said yeah. exactly the same. I said, get the bugger back, man. He said, I don't want the bastard here. He <laughs> said, <laughs> when they do that to me, because remember, you got, they're employees. Yeah. And, 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 and you've got to remember that, 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 that separation. And um, so I picked the phone up and Kevin, there's only, these are the words, there's only they making sort of that come, and he was waiting for the call and he came back. And that's when he went on. And it was about, it, we never interfered. We never, never interfered in the thing at all. And then it happened another two or three times that he used to basically say to them, I've had enough, I'm not taking the, pick, the, the team out. Before the match. I'll give you an example one day. I went downstairs, I used to always go there, I didn't like this. I was always up front of the players. And I would go downstairs, 50 minutes, come on lads, best of luck, get on today. And he never liked that me coming in, because I had a, I used to bond them all, I used to bring the families down here. Yeah. All the families, remember? I right. had uh, the family, the rugby and the football down here, twice a year, and just bonding. And he didn't like that at all. And I went down, and he, he's sitting in his office, on his own, on the desk, in the darkness. Are you alright? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 50 minutes before. I said, good luck, players, good luck. I went upstairs and there's Freddie and Freddie and Douglas sitting there, faces, what's the matter? He's, he's not going up, he's not taking the team out. I said, we said, Daft, I've just been with him. He hadn't the balls to tell me what he told the lads upstairs, that he wasn't taking them. And it was all, I think he felt, the analyzer, that he was the club and not me. Mm -hmm. And he felt in a sense that he was not being rewarded. We would never give anybody shares. Ego, right? really, I suppose. Pardon? His ego. Well, it was, he had all the press set there. And anyway, and so what happened after that was that we reached the point that we decided 
is known as the ordinary blackmailed anymore. And Fletcher typed out a resignation, undated, unsigned. And the next time he walked in for this, I know how you feel, sign that. And he's <laughs> never spoken to me since. No, never. Never spoke to me since. And so we've got, and that was, you can be blackmailed. Well, you can't, no, I mean. We're on a business. Yeah. And it's, 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 it's an employee. employee. And they've got to understand that. Mm -hmm. And they come and go on the nature of football. And, and we're backed in with everything, got everything, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. And um, and, it, and it was a bitter thing, and, and, and he left. And then, of course, thereafter, um, we um, we were um, then had to find managers, you know. Mm -hmm. the, I, the one one thing that sticks out with me is the Andy Cole, the sale of Andy Cole. I mean, was that a, was that a board decision or was it a managerial decision? No, he came in first. Of all. He said, "Sir, I've been approached by Manchester. I want to offer me six million after for Andy Cole." Mm -hmm. and I was a lot of money to say, "I want the salary. So I want to move on beyond Andy." Now you're weighed up. What a time with the footballers. You've got to back your manager. Yeah. He's the MD of a division of your business, and you set the policy up, but you've got to leave him running it. And if you start interfering in that decision on the part, then you're in trouble. Yeah. He then use it against you when it goes wrong. I didn't do it, the board told me. We never interfered. And he came and he said, and we said, okay, we said, I've got somebody in mind I want to buy, I want to use the money, I want to start. It was just common sense. Mm -hmm. And um, Lovely fellow, Andy. One of the nicest player fellas. Him and Les Ferdinand were the two people that um, I would put as, as great people, great fellas, individuals, personalities. And uh, yeah, he left, and and there was hell. But he made he made the decision on the first, and we backed him afterwards. But many had approached him, wanted him, and at the time he wanted to use the six million to and he bought some other players. Um, but that mm. was the situation. Mm -hmm. him. The, the the ground. Is obviously a big bone of contention because obviously I remember a big, the big, you know, the big uh, idea was to move the stadium, mm -hmm. and you know there was you know five or six sites that the Chronicle had pinpointed. But your original plan was to move it uh, to Lisa's Park, just a step, a stone's throw away from where yeah. it is now, and actually own. We would never get, we would never get permission. Mm -hmm. Lisa's Park belongs to the city. Do you think it was a good? Do you think it was a good idea? Do, I mean, in your mind, that's what you wanted to do. Do you think? Do you think the club would be better off doing that? You know, rather than being at St James's Park where they are now, being, well, well, you got disappointed you didn't manage to, to no, pull it, that off. The, 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 we had a, we had to redevelop the ground. Remember after the fire, yeah, and and we had a, a stadium which was tatty, etc. Yeah, and um, after the um, which well fire somewhere, which, where was Bradford Fire nineteen eighty five? Because I'm just because it all it all pins, but you know your takeover came in at in an amazing time. You'd had. Some, you had Heisel, you had had yeah. the Bradford Fire, and then you had um, yeah, the Hillsborough Disaster. So Taylor's all, report, of yeah. course. That's right. Yeah. No, when you're going to develop, <clears throat> we sat down and basically, and, 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 and this is where Woffy was right. This is where Woffy was right and I was wrong. That um, when we had to redevelop, we decided what we're going to do. And Woffy wanted to redevelop St James's Park for sixty thousand. Mm -hmm. And he said, "You'll get the fans in, and of course, you're going to get sixty thousand. You know." And Woffy always said, and he, he had some sketches done. For sixty thousand grand, Woffy John Woffy, and yeah, he was. He, I must admit, he was right. And I was wrong. And we just, could we redevelop? Do we stay in the centre of town? Understand? There's no parking. I do a move outside. If you move outside, where are the sites? Uh, Reasons Park is the the one near at hand. Just up the road, past the BBC, on that. But there was a lot of mine workings, old mine workings there, and it was um, freeholders' land. And I don't think they would have allowed the war to get permission. Mm -hmm. um, and then um, we looked at Gateshead, moved across the situation. And we were having some trouble with the planners at the time, you know, um, and various things. The council, even though the business we bring in, were not that sympathetic to us, you know. Mm -hmm. And I, I was going to move it to Gateshead. And um, the council uh, got the transport authority to say that um, the bridge wouldn't take all the traffic. And they wouldn't, uh, they would fight us on the traffic issue. So eventually, we just had to say, right, let's let's redevelop it for what we could afford at the time. I remember we took a thirty-two thousand. That was the first one. And um, I always remember when we opened the stadium, that they were redeveloped all around, you know, mm -hmm. seats. And I was very proud of myself. From the first day, we had a match. The season following, and um, I walked around the ground, and we opened it early. And and the guy got in, 
which is the John Hall stand now. There's five rows back, remember, there's an old fella sitting in tears. Because I was, I was, I was going to the East Stand, I used to go to the East Stand to say hello to them in the boxes, you know. Mm -hmm. I says, are you all right, Jack? Oh, Mr. Hall, he says, I'm so happy. I says, you're happy, but you're in tears. He says, I've been coming here for 40 years, and I never thought I'd have my own seat here in this. I'm so pleased, lad, I'm so pleased. <laughs> and then I realized that people live their lives through soccer. Yeah. I hadn't realized how much responsibility we had for people's lives, and it was quite frightening mm -hmm. to have that. And I'd never seen, you know, that fella, 40 years, and tears, the tears were running down his eyes. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not, not I'm most of it, but not that. But I thought to myself, that fella's life is here. Mm -hmm. and, and that was a big, big leveler for me. Um, and I said, well, we did it for 32,000, and then we had 14,000. On the waiting list, and they were getting complaints galore about this. Or what you know, you got to buy. So we sat down and said, What do we need to do? And that's where the block was the east stand, mm. having Lisa's park behind it, yeah. and Lisa's touch behind it. So we had to redevelop the lot as much as we could. And um, we redeveloped it as you see it now. I think we've done a good for 50 million, 52, and that was yeah. the mortgage on the ground 52,000. Yeah. And it, it you can you can do the could do a bit more. You can do a Gallagher then. Yes, you can do a bit You'll more. probably take up the sixty thousand. Sixty, yes. Yeah. Right. I remember when David Stonehouse was there when I was working as a fans liaison and I said that he showed us some plans for the Felices Terrace that they could if they bought the building they would have to incorporate the, the list of build over the top. Yeah. yeah. Have to build over the top. But that that, is, that would be a possibility. Yeah, but that's costly. When yeah. you start, you know you're talking about mega, mega money. Yeah. And you've got to say to yourself what size mm. um, but uh, no, I think we've got a, we've got a great ground and a tremendous atmosphere. So what we, we, we left the legacy, mm -hmm. um, and uh, it was just, it just, it's adrenaline football. Mm -hmm. And when you're in it, and especially when you're in Europe, and, but I mean, little stories I can tell you when I put them in the book. Uh, when we were getting um, promotion, mm -hmm. remember the Grimsby match? Yes, sir. Well, my wife and I had the, had the Bentley then, and I, and I, I drove myself and my wife down the M62, to the end where there's a little chef. Mm. It was an evening, remember Matt, was that, that evening yeah. match? Mm -hmm. Beautiful spring evening, what it was. And men needed a smoke. And I wanted a coffee. So we pulled in to the um, to the little chef, finished our coffee and a smoke. And we're just coming out when this battle all transit. Boom! <laughs> stopped. And we're just coming out the doors. And the doors just parked across away from the entrance. And the doors opened. There must have been about 15 of them got out and had a run off. <laughs> with the backs to me that hadn't seen me. And I shouted, Give me the number of your season tickets! <laughs> <laughs> the effing chairman, the effing chairman! The and they ran, back, mind. <laughs> they ran back in the van and they hadn't finished. <laughs> <laughs> and, a minute, and a minute later, so just to show this, they all lined up, came got down, heads down. Apologised profusely and explained what had happened. That the had the crates of brown ale, <laughs> and no ah. service station would let them stop. They'd reached the point where they couldn't go on any further. So I says, "Don't you do it again, and I won't forget any of you lot, and I'll have your season tickets." And my wife shouts to them, "And I won't forget you either, but it wouldn't be by your faces." <laughs> 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 and some of those lads keep coming up to me and I said, do. <laughs> and another time when basically we got a call at the club one day, Freddie and I were sitting, and um, we had a complaint from the service station, up, they come up the year 19, mm -hmm. and they dropped the service station on video. So there, here was the video, and uh, we wrote to them all saying, basically, we're taking a season tickets from you. And they all came back in, there were five of them, apologized, said, right, we'll get back there, and you pay and apologize and give a gift. They all went back, paid the money, get extra. That was the power of losing your season ticket. Mm -hmm. Peterborough, we played Peterborough on 2-0. That was there. It was a lovely day again, we got off the train, and me and I was with me, went to get a taxi. And um, so, um, that's the ground there, you have to walk. So, oh, thank you very much. So we start walking, and as we're going up past the town centre, Hi hey, Chairman, where are you going? So I've got the match, can we join you? Well, there must have been a thousand people that come up the bars. Mm -hmm. And we walked up like the Pied Piper yeah. to the stadium. And when I had to cross the road, 
two of them you know, stop what channel is crossing the road stop <laughs> <laughs> um, we came back from London another time and on a Sunday night after a match and it was the last train I think it was six o'clock or seven o'clock and of course the first class or two were in was at the bottom end when you come on and the, the rest of it's up that way and so me and I got into the first carriage for the smoke and, mm. and as I come around, oh chairman, what do you think it's So two of them came on and sat down, I said, we'll, we'll, we'll move. Then more came on and they said, and the first said, would you mind moving to talk to the chairman? So they cleared everybody out of the first class carriage <laughs> into the next one and they're all the line on the racks and, and sitting in the seats and queues up there and for three hours we'll talk football in the crowd. Ask the chairman this. What do you want? Ask the chairman this. What's he say? <laughs> and that's what just went on and went down. But that was the involvement that we had with everybody, you know. And it was it was just a report and going abroad, etc., etc. And um, but I say, when Keegan went and looked for managers, and this, well, there were some mistakes made, and yeah. um, two of the managers. Um, and I don't know why Liverpool's appointing. I know. <laughs> yeah, I can't believe it. And, and, believe and, it. Um, <laughs> Well, I said I think as soon as as, as soon a fan as of Dalglish, I stuck by Dalglish, and I stuck with him at the end. I was probably one one person who didn't criticise him a great deal. Do you think? I mean, I, I'll touch on the signing of Shearer because that's that's obviously a huge story. But the you know the, the fact that Dalglish didn't have Shearer was that not a big part? Because I mean, you know, Shearer and Dalglish dovetailed at Blackburn, they won the league. If Shearer hadn't got that bad injury, you know, it might have been a different story. You know, if we, we could have won the yeah. league one nil, you know, it, it's all ifs and maybe's. But I think that had a big part with Dalglish, you know. He wasn't. He wasn't the most communicative. No, that was one of the problems. You couldn't understand. I think this. <laughs> but um, yeah, but I think that again, not on the record, just a little bit here. But to me, the fellow that destroyed the club was that was um, Sunas. Sunas, and I'll never understand why we paid eight point five million for Bumsong. Could have had him for free the season before. They paid six hundred fifty thousand for him, and the story I was told shortly afterwards was that. Um, Cubishly had offered six fifty for him. And then when you heard your cattle offered eight eight fifty, he said, Oh, I'm not done the time got me. But when he found out it was eight and a half million, he fell off his seat laughing. <laughs> <laughs> and you've got to look behind the scenes because to where the money went. Yeah. <clears throat> and and this well, is what, it, not you tonight. <laughs> this one but no no we just uh, had we got Bobby was probably apart from King Ramos one of our most successful managers. And well, I don't know who was after when he came, who did he come after? But we needed a manager, and um, Joe Melling of the Mail on Sunday, who Bob Cassis made, yeah. had always been a pal of the club. And he rang us up and said, he said, Elsie wants to come home from Barcelona. She had it away from, she's been around Europe, wanted to come. This is, now, this is in the middle of his contract. Mm -hmm. And he said, Barcelona won Van Gaal after Bobby. But the problem was that Van Gaal's contract had finished in the middle of Bobby's two year run. And they were going to bring Van Gaal in and push Bobby upstairs. Joe had heard this. So Joe arranged a meeting. So we flew out, I was living in Spain, we flew up to, into Barcelona, That's just in case I missed, I stayed there. And they flew private, Freddie and Douglas and they flew down privately. And we met Bobby in his house and we'll talk to him, I'll bring them back. And after a while, Elsie was all for coming home. And um, he said, yes, I'll come. So we shook hands and left it all. And that was great. And if he'd come then, mm -hmm. what a difference it would have made. Yeah. But I went back to, to, to Marbella and I rang him that night just to make arrangements. And his voice, he's, he's, he's thing actually, some people come to see, people have changed, I've just seen these people. I changed and said basically, um, he's not, I said to Joe Melling, he's not coming. He said, get away, because I'm telling you he's not coming. He changed his mind in the middle of it. I like to say basically that he was, he was an honourable man and he wanted to stay with um, Barcelona. I think, you know, it's a bottle and, and so he stayed with them. Had he come there, and not two years later. Mm -hmm. He didn't believe us when we told him that Barca were going to put him upstairs. Mm -hmm. And when he turned us down, yeah. a month later, 
Got Van Gaal's in and Bobby's upstairs. Mm-hmm. And you know, so and they hadn't realised themselves so we were not the next manager. But we've had some you go for the best. Well you had Doug Leash and then you had uh, what do you call him the Dutchman? Rude Hullet. Rude Sexy football. <laughs> quite, the, yeah. sign, the signing of Shearer, you know, oh, I mean yeah. it's a moment you talk about moments in time and Kevin Keegan's well, appointment as manager, but Alan Shearer, you know, for me, I mean that, you know, yeah. the well, first first press conference. This is Fletcher. This is Fletcher, mind you. Yeah. Fletcher, a, he knew everybody in the game by then. He was a tremendous chief exec, and at the Premier League, he was a leading force. And he knew Jack Walker. Him and him, Jack Walker got around because Jack Walker used to come fly up in his plane. Those had fruit drinks. Yes, it was all, you know, we just had to wheel him off the train. <laughs> but he, he said, Freddie said, when you're gonna sell. Alan, let us know. Aye, 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 Jack. And sure enough, Freddie got a call from Jack Walker and said, Manchester United wants to buy him, but I don't want to sell it to them. Are you still interested? Aye, hang on, hang on. And he gave Shearer's for sale. I had to bid the same 15 million. Jesus, 15 million. So boom, boom, pulling money in from everywhere. I said, yes, we'll buy him. And it was done in an instant like that. And of course, we had him in. That was, you know, it came in, it was tremendous. Mm-hmm. Tremendous. There's two people in a sense in, in, in sport Shearer and Johnny Wilkinson. Mm-hmm. It's determined individuals who basically, if you're going to sit the kids, they're your role models. Yeah. They're your role models. Dedicated to the game. Take all knocks and blows and never complain, etc. Wilkinson, I used to watch him kick the ball and kick the ball and kick the ball till I was bored stiff <laughs> to make himself perfect. Mm-hmm. And that, uh, I don't know if everybody can do the same, but look what he is, a world-class player, that's what you've got to do. And Shearer is the same. Yeah. But it was a momentous day, and I remember 12,000 people on the ground. Mm-hmm. I remember they came, but it was, it was that, that's how it was done in an instant. Man United mm-hmm. want them, they've offered 50 million. If you, if you, if you pay the same, you can have them. Mm-hmm. I think within probably an hour. Yeah. That's it. I, I, okay, how can I get some cash in? <laughs> Buy them, bring them here. Mm-hmm. And that was, t- just took off. And uh, tremendous in the middle of time for them. It's a dedicated pro. Greatest game for you in, under your stewardship? 5 0. Against Man United? 5 0. Oh, I, I <laughs> didn't dream that thing <laughs> at night. And I dreamed that, that goal, there were great goals, but that goal of Janola's when he cut in from the, the left yeah. and just swung it in, and a Philippe Albert's yeah. goal, that was something else. And you can you also remember the Barcelona game with Tino Ospila, yeah. when he hung in the end, put the balls in. The two of them, but I think looking for classic games, it was the, the, the Man United game. Was the remember the video afterwards, 5 0, high 5 0. Yeah, yeah, it was. <laughs> and that was to me the, one of the, the greatest games I've seen, and uh, it was brilliant, brilliant. Mm-hmm. I've had some great times. Mm-hmm. Talk about Ferd- Ferdinand and um, Andy Cole as, as you know, professional footballers, your favorite, who was your favorite player? Do you think uh, did, is anyone, anyone? Well, I've got to go back in my lifetime. Yeah, that was Bobby Mitchell. Yeah, Bobby Mitchell. Bobby Mitchell was twinkle toes. Mm-hmm. Bobby Mitchell was basically one of those that just could go around defences and just, you know, do anything. Mm-hmm. Absolutely great. Bobby Mitchell to me, I remember that was that was fine in Melbourne then, okay? That was when I was a kid and I was heavily influenced by him. Mm-hmm. So but I think each era gives its own players. Mm-hmm. You go back to Martin and Donald, which is a great center forward, you know? And you go back to uh, uh, Green, Tony Green, who was a beautiful player before getting injured. So each era brings its own player. So you cannot say there's anything that each one has something to give. But I think if I looked at Twinkle Toes, uh, Bobby Mitchell was just one of the best. But um, the, I tell you who I was surprised at. I didn't want Beardsley because what he's too old. I remember you rang me up. You rang me up. You said he wants to, he wants Beardsley. He's too old. We'll never get any money back from him. I said John Peter Beardsley could do a hell of a good job. I did, and he did. And brilliant Twinkle Toes, of course. Brilliant. Um, Malcolm, the supporter, I mean, you know, everyone, you know, we do a fanzine, Team Talk fanzine is the mag now and the true faith, but you, you were the original fanzine editor. <laughs> tell, tell us a bit about that. Well, I mean, the NSA, <coughs> Castle Supporters Association, which was formed uh, from out of despair, like everything else is mm-hmm. formed, um, we decided we needed something that would uh, get out to the fans. And uh, there wasn't any fanzines at that time any in, the, in the true sense as you see them now and we thought well what about a newspaper what about a free sheet newspaper and I had a little bit of sort of uh, contact with companies and businesses who were 
uh, very similar to myself with regard to what was happening in Newcastle and were prepared to advertise. So we went out and funny enough we got the advertising first in place which actually paid for the production. Uh, we talked to the Chronicle and Journal but they didn't really want to know so we went to the Gateshead Post. And the Gateshead Post group were uh, nice people and they said right we'll produce you a, a sort of an eight page newspaper um, and we came up with the name The Supporter. And the first edition that came out, which I think I gave you a copy of, yes. that's right. The first edition was just after the uh, extraordinary general meeting which we'd had at the airport hotel, where uh, <clears throat> Bobby Rutherford had sort of called me all sorts of uh, nasty names. And, but we'd had a moral victory, because of course we'd got the, uh, the board at that time a little bit on the run. And as Sir John has been saying, that was the sort of, if you like, the, the, the start of things. But at that, continued for 21 editions, the supporter. Um, we even got people in uh, eventually who did a lot of the uh, editorial work and also sold the advertising, so it became a little bit of a business. Obviously you had the, um, the, the number nine bar as well, something which you know a lot of people still talk about. It's obviously the times that I was sent in there. Um, well, but you, you had, you had, you had the bar, <laughs> didn't you? you know, well, we way. actually bought the premises. We bought the whole thing. Uh, I bought it for sixty-five thousand pounds from Crawford's the Printers, um, and then I managed to persuade Vaux Breweries because <clears throat> we're the actual the, the situation, the Irish Centre, as they call it now, directly opposite what was then Newcastle Breweries head office. And I remember Paul Nicholson, the uh, the chairman of Vaux, came up because we'd applied to them for the money mm -hmm. to actually develop the place. And he looked across at upstairs where the concert room is now, looked across at the, uh, <laughs> the brewery site and said, where do I sign? <laughs> In other words, he wanted Vaux's sign on the outside looking straight at Newcastle Breweries. So that was, I mean, they licensed, they just paid all everything. Mm -hmm. But we then handed that over to a group of people who ran it. And unfortunately, they didn't run it terribly well. And I'd forgotten that I'd signed all the joint and several guarantees on the place for the, and I got caught to actually pay off all the debts. <laughs> but it, eventually, I, it was unfortunate I had to sell the place to the Irish. But I mean, you know, it's, it's how things develop. Mm -hmm. But in that, we actually created the number nine bar, which was the bar downstairs, and we got uh, Jackie Norman to open it. Well, Jackie was still alive and still my hero. And uh, <clears throat> we managed to accumulate, I think it was about seven or eight number nines, various ages, from all over the country, Wynn Davis and people like that. And we went down to Bambra's Music Hall. It was on the 9th of June, which is a very significant date. <laughs> <laughs> and we went down to Bambra's and we got a coach provided by Vox Breweries, because Paul Nicholson was big in those sort of things. And we got all the number nines in there, drove up to the Gallagher Club, as it was called. And they went in and opened the number nine bar. So we did a fair bit of sort of theatrical stuff in those days. Yeah. And I mean, <laughs> tremendous publicity. Uh, and then, of course, when that club closed, we then transferred the number nine bar to what was the uh, supporters club mm -hmm. just up the road. And then when that closed, it went down to a, a pub down in, uh, I think, down in Walker. And we got, uh, oh, sorry, when it, reopened up at the supporters club, we got Malcolm McDonald to reopen it. Mm -hmm. And then when it went down to the supporters club down in Walker, we got um, Mirandina to reopen it there. And then of course that place closed completely and it was gutted. And all the pictures, because we had all these lovely pictures done of all the number nine, not just the number nines, but everybody that scored more than 20 goals in a season. Mm -hmm. um, we managed to salvage them and they're now actually in the platinum club at the fashion now. If you look down the walls, you see them there. Mm -hmm. So that's, but the number nine was, is very significant. I mean, as I said before, uh, Jackie Mullen was one of my heroes. The other one was uh, Len White, mm -hmm. little Lenny White, who never played for England, but he was one of those players that could score a goal nine inches off the ground mm -hmm. with his head. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Absolutely fantastic. And a lovely lad. You've got a great relationship with Sir John, and I think you know you're a bit of an unsung hero with regards to the Magpie Group because you know in in the various circles you're involved in. You know you're, you're, you're for me, I missed any castle. You know you've done a lot of stuff, but you you know you, there was a lot of important people in that Magpie Group. 
Um, you know, so John takes the plaudits. He was the man who came along, and you know, as he, 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 he heaps the praise on you there. You know, but I mean, how, how did it how did it make you feel? You know, in, in all your constant battles with the club to finally get you know what you wanted, I suppose. I think one of the <laughs> the great successes, if you like, to me, having endured the <clears throat> the shall we say the the knockbacks, and um, one of the biggest knockbacks, as I mentioned before, was. Um, uh, when the, the bailiffs arrived at the house, and all my friend up and said, "There's this chap uh, who wants to take all the fittings and fit out of the house because of this uh, high court action and the, the debt was." I, I said, "Let me speak to him." It turned out that the fellow, the bailiff, was actually the chairman of Berwick Rangers Football Club. Nice bloke. Mm -hmm. And he said, "Mark and me." He said, "We haven't met, but I know all about you." He said, "Look, I'll give you a 24-hour stay of ex execution." Mm -hmm. If you can have a word at your bank and uh, get, raise the money, and I went down to the bank. I mean, there wasn't a big problem. I managed to raise the money to sort of sort them out. But it, it just, uh, you know, that that sort of way they were treating me mm. with absolute contempt, I thought it was dreadful. So, you know, when I managed in the end to buy Lord Westwood's and the Westwood family's shares in uh, Gavin Westwood's house, that's Lord Westwood's son, who's now. Actually, Lord Westwood, since his mm. father died, uh, over uh, several gin and tonics, I might add. <clears throat> um, it gave me tremendous satisfaction. What Sir John didn't tell you was that he, he had complete trust in the various members of the Magpie group that went out John Woff, Alan Mooney, Peter Ratcliffe, and so on, um, that he gave us actually signed checks. I had in my wallet three signed checks signed by John. And I could use those checks up to half a million pounds. I could make them up. Now that was a hell of a thing. <laughs> <laughs> I always thought, well, I should have kept one of those. I? <laughs> 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 but, uh, no, it's a, the, the satisfaction was of eliminating those sort of people mm -hmm. because they just didn't have any interest. I mean, Bobby Rutherford <clears throat> was a golfer and keen on cricket and he occasionally came to the matches but you know the family the family had inherited the shares he wasn't interested in Newcastle United Westwood was in fairness he was he was chairman of the football league and he was a vice president of the FA and he was he was very immersed in football mm -hmm. but uh, you know he and there was a lot of dare I say corruption went on in those days and it was small corruption, not the sort of corruption you get nowadays in football where we're talking about millions and billions. Yeah. In those terms, they were getting the houses sort of uh, redone or rebuilt through the football club. Yeah. I mean, when the East Stand was put up, uh, Lord Westwood had an extension of his house, and it's the same builder that did the extension. And that's the way they did it, because football directors weren't paid, mm. and they got their sort of they used to have a, what was called a director's turnstile at Newcastle United. And it was all the money from that turnstile went to the directors and they divided it up. Right. And that's the way they, they got the, the, the bits in. Mm -hmm. But just getting rid of those sort of people and getting it into a sort of, you know, being run by proper business people was just a great satisfaction. Mm -hmm. uh, you obviously, you know, follow the club with, you know, great passion still to this day. Um, the supporters trust obviously you know was set up and you know in the wake of you know keegan leaving and you know the, you know a lot of dirty linen washed in public but the you know the supporters trust and this idea of buying the club do you think that's a reality do you think it's something which can which can ever happen i mean the fans didn't back sir john and the magpie group when they were offered a share issue so do you think it's a realistic do you think it's realistic well it didn't happen then i i don't think it will because i think i think football now it's become a, a sort of big business plaything. I mean, uh, you know, we were talking before about all the countries of the world that are now involved in football clubs in this country. And as I said, the only one that uh, hasn't so far been involved is China. <laughs> so watch out, here we go. Um, I, I just think that, you know, a football club run by the supporters would be a wonderful, wonderful thing. But um, there again, you've got an awful lot of supporters I mean, you've got an awful lot of decisions to be made, haven't you? Yeah. <laughs> the, the best, the best football club, as John Hall just said, there is run by one man. Mm -hmm. yeah, 
call it a dictatorship, but it actually succeeds. Mm -hmm. I mean, these, these democratic trusts, organizations, I think, you know, have got great ideas. And great, it's a great sort of thought to actually have something like that. But, you know, I think, unfortunately, we're not, well, I, I don't think we'll ever be ready for it. I just don't think it'll happen. Mm -hmm. I, I do think that all football clubs should have a representative from the supporters on the ball. Mm -hmm. I think that is something that should happen. <clears throat> and that, you know, that, that person should carry the voice of the supporters to the rest of the directors mm -hmm. and the management. And I think that is something that should happen. Mm -hmm. yeah. My dad died in 73, and that's when I got the shares in Newcastle United. And that was when I started, because I wasn't terribly interested in becoming a director, and then it was suggested I had enough shares to become a director, why didn't I? <laughs> this was one of the old directors, mm -hmm. Benton Braithway, who was a cameo character. And he said, well, we need some young blood on the board. <laughs> <laughs> he said, They're all, the average age is about 75, and it was. <laughs> and I mean, they, some of them were really, I mean, old Stan Seymour, old Stan Seymour, yeah. old, was, I mean, literally, you know, he'd have two, two whiskeys and four off the chair. And I mean, it was, it was really bad. I mean, <laughs> they'd been wonderful blokes in that time, but they were just ready for a bit of change. Mm -hmm. And Gordon McKee was the youngest one, and he was in his sort of 50s. And I was in my 30s then. And uh, I was the sort of uh, the young man on the block, you know. Mm -hmm. I was called, I always remember the headline in the journal, I think it was, from one of the directors, a fellow called Jimmy Rush, said, we don't want any whiz kids on the board. I was the whiz kid, so, <laughs> whiz kid. Hey, but there's some, there's some lovely, lovely stories. I mean, I, I should write it all down. The, um, I mean, we'll, we'll, we obviously got back on again. Um, obviously the club nowadays, Mike Ashley and, and yep. Derek Lambayas, so, you know, <clears throat> what's the plan, do you think? I mean, we're all set and guessing, but, you know, do, is there a long-term plan there? What, what, what's your, what's your view on, on I the would, regime? I would hope. I mean, you heard what John said about the, uh, you know, how he, although he hasn't actually said that to camera, how he sort mm -hmm. of uh, sold out um, to them. And it was an interesting one. I mean, I, John may not want to repeat it, so <laughs> I, for the purposes, I'll say yeah, that. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I knew that John was actually negotiating with some people from the Far East, and uh, he was down in London, and he was actually approached by uh, Mike Ashley's people to say that they would like to buy the club. And uh, he met them, and uh, he sort of he said to them, "Do you not want to do due diligence?" Mm -hmm. There he is now. You can complete it. <laughs> <laughs> right. What else do you want to go over? We're just talking about the the, the sale of the club, I suppose. That's, that's well, you know, and you mentioned it before there about well, how you know well, how he done the deal with uh, with uh, Ashley, and I think. Well, you know, yeah. What shall I say? Um, you feel, I think, I think it's just this, you know, was it, was it a hard decision first and foremost to get No, out? no, it was, it was, it was, wasn't that, it was, you were I was quite happy, them. I was quite happy in the business for this thing until Abramovich came in. Right. And people like myself are not detailed people. Mm -hmm. You leave that to others. You know, people that carry a message through have the vision. And that's why I know I'm always the visionary. I know how to build a shopping centre. I know how to do that and the other. And quite happy to come and have something, but I was retired by then. I wasn't quite retired. I was still there looking after the shares now. And when Abramovich came in, I was concerned because, in my view, he didn't come in for football. Mm -hmm. He came in to get a passport. He came in to get away from the Russian mafia. And he came in to protect himself. And he bought a football club, I believe, for the publicity that surrounds it. So you have this profile, touch me if you can, that sort of thing. Oh, he, that's my view, Noel. Mm -hmm. And he came in, and at the time, all the clubs in the Premier League were under pressure from their government. And the sports minister of the time was the, the MP from Sheffield. Ah, oh, yes, yes, yes. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, my no, no, not no. Mine. A nice fella, yeah. from Sheffield, MP for Sheffield, mm -hmm. and he was giving us, I knew him very well, he was giving us a lot of flack, and all the papers were, by getting our financial house in order. Mm -hmm. And now it started to become an understanding amongst the clubs, 
that in the turnover, you, you broke it down into X percent for wages, X percent for staff, X percent for training, this sort of thing. So we lived within our means, and that was starting to come through. And, and because we, if we didn't, the government were going to bring in legislation. And then suddenly out of the blue, this man of Bromwich comes in with a billionaire, unlimited wealth, and literally changed the game forever. Mm. And um, when he came in and threw money at it, to the degree that he did, I just looked at it there. Remember, most of us say were regional businessmen who'd grown up with our clubs as supporters, invested in our clubs. So it was rooted at home. And now we have these overseas billionaires coming in mm -hmm. and challenging the system and destroying the exercise. I don't know. Now then, when you stand back and you look at it, and I said, I said, there is, I'm telling you, I said, the Douglas and Trump, there is no one amongst us who can actually compete with them. Nor should we try to compete with them, because if we try to, it'll destroy our businesses. And I said, you can't compete. And I said, you're going to have to invest millions and millions more if you're going to challenge this man, if you're going to compete with this man. And that was my view of where the future was going to go for football. And I got a lot of flack from them. Douglas and Freddie, and I said, no, I said, Douglas, I said, I'm not going to risk our money competing with this man. We haven't got that wealth. We've got a lot of money, but we haven't got that wealth. And, 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 and basically, and that was, I said, I'm going to sell our shares. I'm going to sell our shares now because that's time I felt we moved on in these circumstances. No problem if it was the normal thing with the, the way it was. But I said, this is a new ball game. And, um, I got a lot of flack, but I said, I'm going to sell the shares. And uh, it took me two years. And I talked to lots of people, etc., etc., and a lot of uh, wasting time. And I was negotiating with some Malaysians who came over for a cup final. I forgot when it was, must be about four or five years ago. Right. And I was meeting them on the Monday in London after the cup final. When I got a call, from a representative of a person I didn't know. And he says, I understand, it was actually from an Icelandic bank. I said, yes, I'm interested in selling my shares. And I said, the reason why. <clears throat> I said, I'm looking for that thing. And um, uh, he said, well, can we meet you? I said, well, I'm meeting these Malaysians, and I've given them a word. And he says, well, can I meet you when you get off the train? <clears throat> so <clears throat> I said, the meeting was 11 o'clock. The train got in at 10. There he was, this representative thing, in this magnificent um, Rolls Royce. Took me to the car, to the hotel, this office of the lawyer, Freshfield, I think it was. And um, it was like this size, full, packed. And um, they wouldn't tell me. Who, I said, well, I'm not going to negotiate, but I'm going to negotiate direct. So eventually they brought them in. And not him, but his, ch his chief exec and his financial man. Of Ashley, and well, I've heard of Ashley, but I didn't know him at all then. Mm -hmm. And I said, for all I wanted to sign up. I said, no, I'm going to see the Malaysians. I said, well, come back after you've seen them. So I went to see the Malaysians, and they wanted six weeks due diligence. Well, I knew Freddie wouldn't give them that. Mm -hmm. So I came back and said, I'll negotiate. So we sat there, just gone down for the Monday, had no clothes or anything. And sat there and they brought out and I got my lawyers down there to come along and uh, by and by the winter night the deal was done and in the middle of this meeting and again don't destroy Freddie on this but in the middle of the meeting this is not for publication mind right mm -hmm. understand what it is um Freddie went into hospital mm -hmm. and I was dealing with Bruce and I was quite open I didn't try everybody knew I said, I said I said Bruce I am going to sell our shares now I said, he knew my reason, he said, yeah, yeah. And um, Bruce said to me, I said, what do you want? He says, I'll talk to Freddie. And he came back, he says, we'll sell. Are you sure? Yes, we'll sell. So I said, I've done my deal. And on the phone, they asked me, I said, he wants to sell. And they spoke to Freddie, Freddie uh, to Bruce, and Bruce will sell. <clears throat> so um, I did my deal, and then they went to do that deal with, with Bruce. Because they wanted 100% to take it private. Mm -hmm. And um, I was very surprised when later on Freddie came out of the hospital and said I'd stopped him at the back. 
Bruce hadn't got the same. Bruce yeah. hadn't got the same. Bruce wanted ago. to be out. Mm. Uh, Bruce basically wanted to be out. He yeah. was a, a businessman mm -hmm. on the thing, and it was taking too much. He, he had a very, very thriving business. Yeah. And um, he didn't want to see the money going out into the club, and he wanted to sell. So that's how the deal was done. But I told everybody for two years, and I, I sold for that reason because there was no way could we compete yeah. with that kind of money coming in. And if this was the start of new people like him coming in, it changed the game forever. Yeah. There was no room for provincial <coughs> English businessmen who had a certain wealth, but not the billionaire's wealth. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's the reason why. And, and I hoped that this fellow, and I sat down with him, I said, why do you want Newcastle? I wanted to sell, but I wanted to make certain that people coming in were going to take the club forward. Mm -hmm. And he said, i just sold out. Got a knock. That's fine. They've, they've come in and gone out again. Okay. And he said, um, um, what do you want to buy? I spent three days with these reps. He said, we want to market our sports goods in the Far East. We need a club like Newcastle with an image and some brand. We want to use it as the brand to market our goods and image in the Far East. Which made a lot of sense for them and for Newcastle. It meant that they would market basically Newcastle globally, mm -hmm. which we hadn't done. Mm -hmm. yes, that was the next stage, but we'll we want global people. And that's, and I said, fine. I said, that's what he says, yes. And he said, and we, we sat down to long and hard about basically football. And I said to them, you, 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 you either have a director of football, you have a manager or a director of football. Mm -hmm. But you've got you make your mind. And I said, there's arguments for both. I said, we've had lots of managers, and all you ever do, if they go wrong, you pay them lots of money. If you have a director of football, they can then do the football and go look for players, etc. on your guide. But you know, that's the two. And he said, well, the first thing we're going to do is take it private. So they brought in Moat to take it private. And when he did that, he did his job. Now, the man, and I all stand by him for this. He came in with good intent to take the club forward. Mm -hmm. On the basis, he was going to use, I mean, not a fool, but he was going to use Newcastle as a brand with his brand. Mm -hmm. And the two globally around the world would be marvelous. Yeah. And um, that was the step forward. That's great. Now, after that, when Mo went, he never, I mean, so he never communicated with anybody, really. But he then, in my view, made a mistake. He went and he took advice. As I said to before, I think he's the Jewish fraternity. And Tottenham's a Jewish club. Mm -hmm. And Paul Kemsley is a friend of his. And he took advice from Paul Kemsley as to what he should do with the football. Which he didn't know. Like me looking at somebody, he went to Paul Kemsley. And that advice from Paul Kemsley, he brought in Keegan. And I said to him, look, I said, think twice before you're in Keegan. I said to him, what to call him, the chief of I said, you know, he said, you know, it's like me, or maybe yesterday's people, you need to move on. But the fans were chanting, Keegan, Keegan, Keegan. <clears throat> it's like Dalglish, 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 Dalglish. Yeah. There comes a time when you've got to make your own, but he went, he, he went with the fans, he went with the crowd, the bang of the crowd, mind you, he didn't step back and look at it rationally. And I don't know what his deal was with basically with, with, with Keegan, whether Keegan was coming as a manager, or basically a director of football. Well, that was between him and Keegan. And of course, when he started then taking advice from Paul Kemsley, and Paul Kemsley said he wanted a director of football, there's this difference of opinion between this Keegan the manager and that, and that's where Keegan said, you know, this is not what I came in for. And of course, when, when Ernie Wise was... Uh, Dennis. I don't know. Dennis. <laughs> <laughs> when, Dennis, when Dennis Wise was basically... Hey, son, John. <laughs> well, don't put that in the book. Anyway. When Dennis Wise was appointed, there was bad, there always had been blood blood between Keegan and Dennis Weiss going back years. Mm -hmm. And to bring this man in without anything, Keegan's a sensitive man. And basically, he's going to react, and he did react. And he said, Bess, I'm not having this, basically, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm either manager or I'm not manager. And so, so you've got to really get behind the scenes to see exactly what the deal that was done. Mm -hmm. Or whether it was a loose deal, and that it wasn't really, that's, it's when you met Keegan, what was the deal on the table? That's what was the understanding. And it went wrong from there. And Keegan walked out. Now, um, 
He made some mistakes, but if I was in his position, I would have been angry and I would have left the bloody consulate after the vilification that he got in the press. To me, <clears throat> that wasn't totally justified. Get out the tune, and all the headlines and things like this. Um, I, I, there was no need, nobody likes that. Even who you are, you know, kings, queens, or yes, any of us here. The vilification was terrible. And, and I would have got paid off to be quite honest as well. And I, those headlines did a lot of damage. And I've told the Chronicle man, mm -hmm. the show, that did a lot of damage. Um, and it broke down relationships, basically, to the extent that basically the, the, the statement they issued at the beginning of the season was just a, <laughs> the, the, uh, don't come and say, that's what you're getting. Yeah. And that wasn't a, a statement for related, related to the press. But he was honest, that's what I'm going to do. In effect, I'm saying, I'm going to get out when I can. And it, it will be better for the club. And I think, you know, if, if um, he could get out and somebody else comes in, it was going to give us long-term stability. Because you cannot go on in this. I'm very, very surprised that um, the, um, the position we're in, because we're just an average team. Yeah. And I think that, you know, uh, uh, what do you call him, um, last manager? Keaton. Yeah. Yeah. Lovely fellow. I met a couple of times. Lovely, yeah. lovely fellow. Um, and I can see where he was coming from. I haven't been there, but... Fletcher always told me a maxim, basically, in football. He says, if you've got an average team, you've got to win your home games. Because mm -hmm. you're not going to win many away games to get those 40 points. Yeah. And we lost too many home games. And we were only two or three, four, four points above that relegation place. And in management, as they're all doing now with West Ham, the rest of them, and Aston Villa, there comes a point in the owner when you make, that's what you paid for. When you make that decision, not what all of you say, mm -hmm. I shall, it's the owner who has to make that decision. Am I going to stay with this man, carrying through, or is he going to take me down, and then to try to get up again with the fans being on your back, you're later on when you got rid of him. You have to make, I would have probably left it. He's a nice fellow, and he basically, he took us up, but whether he was a manager for the Premier League, I don't know. But I just know I went to all the home matches and I saw some rubbish in the home matches. And we won some matches away we shouldn't have won. Mm. And, and I didn't want to see ourselves in the position that Middlesbrough is in, mm. where he should have got rid of um, Southgate. Southgate, long before he did. Or look like nearly relegated. <clears throat> but the nice people you see, John. Southgate and Hewton, nice people. And it's, but the, the players take advantage of them. And exactly. The players take exactly. advantage of them. Exactly. And rather exactly. point, we'll, we'll yeah. play some rubbish, etc. Yeah. And the team's average team. And I would have probably left it until the middle of January mm -hmm. and seen how we're getting from one day. You want to stay with the Mamas. You don't want to change. Nobody wants yeah. to change. But today, success is everything. You lot demand it. <clears throat> you lot demand it. You lot demand it. And it's either pouring millions in to match. And I would never do that unless I was a billionaire. Yeah. And money. But as a businessman with average cash, you can't afford to risk your family business. Nor should you do that. The football club should stand on its own, the business and the sport. Yeah. But trying to match with £40 million pounds for a player, impossible. So you're then looking around and building a team of second players yeah. and staying in the middle of the thing. But if you're ambitious, you've got to be up there. Yeah. And it's a different ballpark. And Ashley, if he stays, I think has the wealth to challenge. Yeah. Uh, and, but he's, I think he's been so hurt with the attacks that have been on, he's made some mistakes. He's taken, but just because of the lack of knowledge of the game and, and, and football's not like this, there's so much emotion attached yeah. to it. And you've got you've got to liaise with the fans. And I don't think he ever did that. And coming in wearing the shirt, I think basically the fans didn't want that. They want their chairman to be a chairman. That's right. To give the club the status, basically. Yeah. Uh, you don't want to be totally one. There's, uh, there's the northern managers up there, this is business. And the, the owners up there. And, and, and I think um, Mike went the wrong way. But you cannot, you cannot question his intent. I'm telling you, as I was there, Derek, his intent of coming into the club, it just went wrong when he took bad yeah. advice and he stuck with his pals. And that's, you, you, you do this. Yeah. You know, you sort of say, who do I know? Who's going to give me some advice? Kemsley, Tottenham, top successful team, 500 million pound business. You know, yeah. brilliant. So he took the wrong advice and it, and it went wrong up here in the papers and it just got off to a bad start. And um, so we're now in this situation where um, but I mean, which you know, I don't know. That, uh, um, it's an interesting story, this I'll tell you. That um, Pardew 
managed Southampton. Okay. Well, a year past September, I got a call from Nicola, a business friend of mine for Credit Suisse. He looks for investors, looks for money, you know, the right. I've known him for a few years. And he ran me and said, I'm a Swiss friend who's interested in going to buy Southampton. And I said, don't be so stupid, you know, yeah, doing the football, you want to stay out. But he did, and I said, look, I'll come and see you and have a chat. He said, yeah, please do commit the honour. Well, a month later, I got cancer. So I was so involved with the treatment, I forgot all about him. And just after we appointed Pardew, John, Nigla here. Hi, he says, how are you? Says, Where have you been? I said, well, next time. He says, he says, why have you signed that man? He says, I just sucked him. And he gave me a story, which, from the point of view, would uh, look myself out now. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm going down to see him, but I'm not going to say what he says because it might be libelous. <laughs> <laughs> last, last point before we uh, finish. Um, would you do anything differently? You no, know, with hindsight now, is anything you would change? If you could go back in time, is anything you would change one thing with Newcastle United in mind, you know, just from Newcastle perspective? What I've changed one thing, I think, had Abramovich not come in, right? Mm -hmm. I think we would have driven the club further forward. We could have managed it, but we, we couldn't have copied it. Would I change the club? I wouldn't have been, this is not for a record, sure. I wouldn't have appointed some of the managers of the world. Right. Um, I think uh, we went for the best. You know, we always went for the best and it didn't work out. Your manager is your key. He picks the players, you've got it. And we look at Alex Ferguson, for ten, how many years, eight years before he managed to get a rhythm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Trying to find Arsene Wenger, the best managed club mm. that I've ever been to was Arsenal. One of the mind is that a panache style. Everything was run. <clears throat> it was the old family's book with money and panache style. And when you went down there, the boardroom was full of the ambassadors and it had that elegance and personification of, of success. Mm. It smelt money and it smelt. It wasn't, it wasn't rush anything. It was just beautifully put together. Mm -hmm. Nice people. And Arsene Wenger, brilliant manager. A thinker and someone who has that French market title for the players. Um, and if I, I would, I would have liked to have had someone, a manager, like Ferguson, who would have stayed at the club. I think probably Bobby, yes, if I could do something, uh, I would have gone back and tried to convince Bobby when they decided not to come to come to us. Right, after Keegan. After Keegan, yeah. yeah. With the Keegan players, the entertainers still there. Because Daglish got rid of most of them, didn't he, and bought his own. But I would have, I would have, I would have, that's what I would have I think that, that was the one mistake I didn't push hard enough. And um, I know why it was, but again, not for publication. He was going to lose a million pounds right. if he left Barcelona. Right. Had I matched that, he would have come. It was unfair for me to say to Bobby, come. And I never realised that. I just thought he wanted to come home. <coughs> And I should have put that extra million pounds on the table. And I didn't, I never thought about it. I never thought to do say, well, as he wanted to come home. Mm -hmm. And I'd say he wanted to come home and basically match his salary and everything. But I think basically we're going to lose so much coming and have I put it here. But that was the one thing I regret that I didn't convince him to, to come. When he said he'd come and he changed his mind, I should have gone back and I should have basically um, sat down. So that evening, I should have gone on the plane, gone down. Should have been harder and more determined in Africa because I think had we got him here, because after Keegan is the most successful manager, mm -hmm. and he was he was at the peak of his time in the Barcelona, and I reckon he would have carried on where Keegan left off, but he would have built it in a. Keegan was like was the original entrepreneur. Yeah. Bobby was the professional, yeah. experienced professional. Mm -hmm. He would have brought that stability at the club, which we needed. And that's probably the one regret that I have, that I didn't go back and, and say, come on, Bobby, no, 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 don't change your mind. You said you're coming, please come, please come. But I didn't, and it, got, it went away from us. And I'd always said, what would have 
what would a Newcastle have been like? Would have won leagues, would have been up there, the best, and that was the one, the one thing I would have, I regret. Mm. But apart from that, it's 20 years, an exciting 20 years, and you know, to have that opportunity left from Washington, mm. who stood on the terraces where basically, I mean, there were just earth things, and if you were in the crowd and you wanted a wee, you were in somebody's pocket. <laughs> 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 it did. I mean, it was. I mean, yeah, I couldn't get the pie corner. If you anybody remember, get the old fellas. The pie corner. You get a pie and a. Oh, the standards at the ground were appalling. We put up with so that we put up with atrocious conditions. Remember the peanut man. Uh -huh, yeah, right. He used to put, throw the peanut and bag of peanuts. At but we we'll put up with it <laughs> because we didn't want to look at the castle. We didn't challenge the system. No. Mm -hmm. We didn't. You know, if the team scored a few goals, we're happy. You know. And, and we never had the glory we should have had, and it's always eluded Newcastle United. So, so often we've been the bridesmaid, never the bride. Mm. And I, I just wonder what you've got to do. We got probably closest, but I just wonder what we've got to do to get that, to get that stability in the club. And I think we're going to have to find somebody. I don't think. I think you've got to accept the fact that Ashley's probably going to move on. Mm. The sooner it is, the better. And what we have to look for, the person coming in, is going to give us that long-term stability. It's got the wealth to match the Abramovich, the Man City, because it, the money's changed. There's top four there now. And, and you'll never break into that unless you've got the wealth to spend. Mm -hmm. But if, 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 if I'll be great. I'd love if Abramovich didn't win anything. Yeah. And, the, and the, he, he pulled out. Mm -hmm. And I broke it at Man City. Even. Because these people, they come in on a whim. And they leave on a whim. Yeah. They're not here for long term. It's just a moment in time, it seems like a good thing to my football. But we all suffer in the game. The game suffers. Yeah. Because the money comes in and changes things. And it, and you cannot compete. And the game goes away from the fans. Because if the other clubs we have to put our prices up. You know, and we can only buy second second players. Mm -hmm. Kinda of buy the best. So your team's always gonna languish in the middle. Purely and the wage level's gonna the agents, agents are agents, agents. which are Basically, I died. Covered, money. You haven't covered agents. <laughs> no, <laughs> don't, don't spot it. Don't spot it. Plenty of time. <laughs> agents. Oh, yeah. And when it came in my time, I had this <clears> argument <throat> always with um, Rudy's agent, Stratford. Stratford, yeah. Because sometimes, <laughs> so, when we first started with this one, we had the Duncan. That's right, yes. We wanted to go back to, uh, we wanted to start back to um, Everton. And the agent put on a fax. He wouldn't let him go unless we paid the agent. I forgot <laughs> how much it was, 300 or that. Who was that? Which player? Duncan Ferguson. Duncan Ferguson, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> oh, and, and we said, this is stupid. And that was on the side. We're not paying him, Tom, no. And uh, we didn't pay him. But after that, it started coming in and stretching all them. If you want my player, you've got to pay me. Hmm. Well, and that's, that's, if you look at what's going out of the game, the agents, the parasites. Agents yeah. are parasites on the football side. They might represent the players, the players might want the agents to get the best team from them, but the parasites, as far as the game goes, in a sense, they're destroying the game. Money goes out of the game, it doesn't recycle. But what they're doing, in effect, is that, that why, why should a club be blackmailed yeah. by an agent of a player club once, and he says to them, my player's only coming if you pay me. Yeah. That should be, I mean, you don't, your lawyer doesn't charge another person. Yeah. If you get a lawyer to act on your behalf, yeah. You pay your lawyer, mm -hmm. but in a sense, these parasites that are in the game have actually basically um, have just taken hand, hold of it, and there's nobody big enough. Even the Premier League's not big enough, and I think it's illegal, isn't it, to pay? If you get an agent to do, if, if you ask an agent to sell one of your players, mm -hmm. then you've, act, you've asked him to act on your behalf, then you're on a bank to pay him the deal you've agreed with him. Mm -hmm. But you shouldn't bloody well have to pay a player's agent. The player should be big enough and not greedy. The same way that he should, the player should pay his agent for the work he does for him. Not and not expect the club to do it. But the clubs are blackmailed. And someday somebody might have the balls to stand up, but I can't well, see both it. Both clubs are paying. The, the, the selling club and the buying club are well, both paying the agent. And 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 that, that, that money could go to the academy. That money could, uh, they should, the player should pay the agent. But is there anybody big enough in the Premier League well, to you stop need it? it? There isn't anybody in football at the moment, John, that stands up and be counted. You know, a, a really. How can they say somebody a figurehead? Players not going to do it. No, no, there isn't a figurehead in football at the moment, mm -hmm. national. Well, when you get when you get Man United, these people just because yeah. there's money. We, we had a prime example. He's, he held the club to blackmail, didn't he? Yeah. They're yeah. going to leave. That's it. You know, to get the better deal, and the agents. Well, you know, Stratford again, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> say no more. Say no but more. It's, <laughs> it's 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 a sense you have. 
they're as bad as the bankers, you know? Yeah. We'll moralize over the bankers. Yeah. <coughs> it's time the fans sort of moralize over the agents yeah. what they're taking out of the game and not putting anything back in. Exactly. <coughs> they're parasites. As far as the game goes, as far, they've got a duty to that player mm -hmm. to give him the best way to set up. But a player signs a contract, he should stay by that contract. Yeah. Not want to change it sometime. Mm -hmm. and, then, and after that, it's just pure blackmail. And I can't understand how we allow it to happen. But um, but I'm not in the game now. I get probably criticised. What about a wage cap? Do you think it never the, works? Uh, no, the trend. You've got to make the clubs you work. Get round it, yeah. You, well, the clubs <laughs> and the money in the boots. No, 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 when it was a wage cap, and um, what uh, George Eastman says, you That's know, right, yeah. Yeah. well, it was uh, they put them to put cash in the boot. Yeah. yeah. No, no idea. They did money in the boot. Money went in the boot. And you come, it's in there, don't put your toes in, you get there. It was, it was changed then. But that's what happened, and that's what happened. You can get around it. Yes. You can engage them for your club, what do I say? you're engaging for your business. And yeah. pay, you know. So there has to be, you've got to, the only way I can say is to make the clubs live within the income. Mm. Yeah. So then, yeah, which is what we're trying to do, so your income is that, and you're allowed basically to. I think what's his name? Well, FIFA actually, yes. That's uh, not FIFA, it's UEFA. UEFA, yes. That, that, that oh, was, no, no, no. no, 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 no that's great. This um, is a set platter. I'm not with Patini a lot, but <laughs> Patini, basically. That's the one, yes. But that basically, what he's trying to do mm. is a good win. It is. But they've then got to equalise it because the French clubs used to get subsidised by the local authorities. Yeah. The local authorities built the stadiums and give it to them for now. Mm -hmm. So there's not, a, not an equal. You look at Barcelona. Barcelona. The national club. The government's never ever going to get that goal. The same with, with, with um, Real Madrid. When I first got into the game, I went to see Real Madrid, how they're organised. Real Madrid had a debt of £142 million. Pounds, a debt of hundred, which is a people's club. Nobody has the money to put in. So what did they do? They had a training ground just up from the, in the middle of the city. They went down to, it's recorded this, they went down to see the city. Um, what development can they give us here? Calculated how many square feet they needed. Gave them permission for this. We have to develop and sold it on for 150 million. So they paid off the debt. And then they gave them a site near the airport for a training ground. Because they'll never let the clubs, and they'll find a way. The Continentals don't think like this. The Continentals are subsidy. It's a socialist state or whatever, you know, Europe. And you'll not, they'll not let the national teams go that way. Any of them, if they've got the cash, they'll put it in. And so we're, we're fighting with that. So there has to be a level playing field with all the rooms. Mm -hmm. And the French team, the rugby teams, the stadiums are all subsidised. Yeah. The local authorities. So you can It's not a level playing field. So if there's going to be a level playing field. It's got to be right across the board. So like Man City. Man City got that stadium. Does anybody else ask what rent they got for it? Because Burnstone, one of them there, the chief executive uh, of Manchester, put them in the deal. Now they got a subsidised deal, and we had to put all our money into the stadium. Because it was which, really Commonwealth Games. And, and yeah. they basically got something cheaper than what they should have paid for it. And then there's pushed by. He wanted that. So you, you've got to stop that. There has to be a level playing field for everybody. But whether you'll get that in this ideal world, well, I don't think so. Because the world's not ideal. Yeah. But um, I can only see that happening with um, um, paying out of income. So we at Newcastle, because if we get a winning team, you're capable of getting, you probably have to put your ground to 60,000. Yeah. yeah. And 65. And you'll get a field all the time. Um, it's just a small number. Even, look, I mean, one more in the first division. We'll get them. Forty-five thousand, right. yeah. way above anybody, anybody else. Yeah. We get fifty-two thousand. We're way up at top thing. Yeah. Yeah. They'll turn up for anything. They will. No. That's the loyalty will. But no, as I said, dude, it's, it's the last twenty years have been interesting. These lads got me in, which are sometimes a curse. But <laughs> uh, no, we've had it all good. I'm going to have to write a book. On, uh, we're just talking about that. Right. For, for that meeting there, yeah, we're just saying it needs to be catalogued, you know. Mm. Oh, you get everybody back together and do even get Neil Neil's runs a media company do a, a documentary about it, you know, you could do it very easily. It's fascinating. You've got to get his all back around the table again. No, no I've, got, I've, got, I've, got, I've got I've got so much on I've got to be had a year up with the cancer. It's under control now, but I don't know how long I've got, so I've really got to put some time. The cancer the drugs. The cancer becomes immunity a drug. Uh, eventually, two or three years, but there's three new drugs on the market, which basically can keep you going. So in the last few years that I've got, I've really got to sit down. I've got the Metro Centre to do. I've got the football club in this place to do. I'm doing. The people have thought I'm writing the history of Winyard here now. Right. But I cannot do it alone. I need people to help me. I right. cannot research it and I bring all the stuff together. Maybe we'll bring the Magpie Group together again, mm. and maybe the story in Castle United. Maybe we'll do that. You know. Yeah, I think it'd be good.
But I'll get all the stuff I've got here. I've got, got the records and the Chronicle's got the headlines on that. Mm. Great deal that, like, my wife would love that. it because I'd get rid of all the stuff I've got stored at home. <laughs> 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 but it, it, it is a story in itself. Oh, it it was a story of, you know, great times. Great oh, times. I, get, I sit back, oh, I remember that. Oh, I remember that. And when you get on it, but you can't remember everything, but it's keep coming back. But mm. it's not traveling abroad. It was, I don't know, I forget. Um, I think I fell up with Bobby one day. When we came back to Mar remember the Marseille game? Yeah. Oh, God, I have it. Mm -hmm. I was managing them. We came back. And I, was, I came to the airport early, left and I was sitting on the fans came and I started giving me back. I said, Yeah, I said, it's terrible. And I just said, Yeah, Bobby, I didn't play for Bobby today. And his brother was there, standing next to them. And I think it sort of um, caused a bit of ill feeling with Bobby. Mm -hmm. But um, Bobby actually, didn't like to be criticised. I actually went to Bobby's brother the, the next year, the day after, and I played some work. It was just rather bizarre. Mm -hmm. Really? Oh, it's a small world, and you've just yeah, said that. Yeah. I actually met him, you know, when he came home. Just played some tree work for him. Yeah, he met who? So Bobby's brother. And what did he say? We were just very disappointed about it all, wasn't he? Eh? Hey? We were just very disappointed about what had happened. And, you know, it's just bizarre that he's had this conversation, and now, you know, mm -hmm. when the place, place some work for him. Yeah. That's through my profession. That's yeah. one, but not just a fan of saying, I said, oh, they didn't play for Bobby today. It's very disappointing. Mm -hmm. And I think they said, and, and, but it is, it's, I think, and when I when I look at those little shits <laughs> that basically that were had that really Bellamy, Dyer, 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 and uh, who was the other one? Lee Boyer, yeah. Boyer. Oh, yeah. That's right. The ones that had the punch up on the yeah. 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 Well, I was living in Spain <coughs> then uh, for a couple of years for tax, and, then, and they came up with a train for the season at. Um, in my bed. Oh, the, uh, that's the yeah. complex place, yeah. And um, Bobby's my sister, we'll have a dinner for you, John. So they booked a restaurant and three of them didn't turn up. Those three. Mm -hmm. He sent them home next day. But they gave them a hard time and they were the ones that caused it to lost the dressing room. Okay. And once you start to get groups in the dressing room, mm -hmm. good, and they just, I suppose there comes a time like all of us when I kind of fit in with the thinking of my grandsons now. Mm -hmm. I'm another generation. Yeah. And sometimes you basically have to accept it's time to move on. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, uh, what the, what, I'm disappointed in Dyer because he had some his potential, etc. Mm -hmm. um, but Bellamy was always an evil bastard. <laughs> well, I worked on the, I worked on the key side, you know, I was a doorman for 18 years and I mean, obviously you saw them at their worst, you know, burning 20 pound notes in front of people and, you know, one night when Craig Bellamy came down, was Stuart Watson, like a well-known villain in, in Gateshead. He'd, uh, he'd come into the VIP part of C nightclub this night and all the players were in Shearer giving him that. Stuart Watson went up and was asking all the players to sign the autographs. And he went to Craig Bellamy and he said, um, he says, can you just sign that please, uh, Craig, you know, make quite polite, you know, for a gangster. And he, uh, he goes, say please. And uh, Stuart Watson looked at him and I thought he would, he would have just lamped him on, you know, and he went, no, can you just sign this for me, kids? And he goes, say it please. <laughs> and he picked Bellamy up. He had him up by the throat. Honestly, his legs wouldn't, didn't touch the ground. And we had obviously had to get a hold of Stuart Watson and take him away. But we'll put Bellamy out for his own safety, you know. He was a crackers. But that dire story is true. You know, burning 20 pound notes in front of people. Horrendous. Terrible. Different breed. Different breed of people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The rugby's different to the football. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When you come at the rugby, they're a more intellectual set. Yeah. They've been there. Private schools, most of them playing rugby, and that's a different ball game. When, when they applaud the players coming off, and the, the professionals change, but there's still that theme running through of, of a, a higher intellectual playing mm -hmm. in the football. But uh, just but, but they, were, they, they gave Bobby a hard time, and I used to go down, and there was definitely, definitely different like factions. Factions. Mm -hmm. and, that can, and once that happens, yeah. you've lost it, oh, yeah. and you either get rid of the players, or you've got to go bring somebody in to hit them. <clears throat> but uh, they gave Buddy a, a wrong way, it was a shame. Uh, but. Uh